Hello everybody, this is Mr. Seymour. This is going to be module 1.2 for our world history course. And what we're going to study is periodization. And this is a study of classifying events in history into periods of time. After completing this lesson, we should be able to understand how historians divide world history into major time periods that are based on common events and major turning points. We will list and explain each of the important time periods in world history and understand how societies can be evaluated on the basis of a model called SPICES, which is to look at societies in terms of social structure, political structure, interactions, cultural structures, economic structures, and spaces or geography. We often see the terms BC and BCE and AD and CE. We're more used to seeing BC and AD, but now a lot of the books are using BCE and CE. So what's the difference? So you may be used to seeing dates with BC or AD. For example, 2750 BC means 2750 years before the birth of Christ. Or AD 476 would be um, 476 years after the birth of Christ. So why don't we use these abbreviations a lot anymore? The abbreviation BC stands for before Christ and AD stands for the Latin phrase Anio Domini, which means the year of our Lord. Because history belongs to everybody, and because not everybody is a Christian, many historians have been using these new terms BCE and CE as more of a uh, politically correct way to address uh, time descriptions. The abbreviation CE stands for Common Era. It is used in place of AD. So 1492 CE is the same as AD 1492, which if you notice, is sometimes incorrectly written as 1492 AD. The abbreviation BCE stands for before the Common Era and it's used in place of BC. So the year 1625 BCE is the same as 1625 BC. Hello and welcome to my timeline. This is a timeline I am working on in Prezi. So I want to explain to you what BCE and CE are and compare them to BC and AD. I also want to look at how we can read year dates in BCE or BC. So here's a timeline. At one end, we have 2000 BC. At the other end, BCE. At the other end, we have 2000 CE or Common Era. You'll notice that that's where 2012 is, 2012 CE. But wait, wasn't it 2012 AD? Well, you're right, it was 2012 AD, but we are moving from AD to CE and BC to BCE. So why are we moving from BC to BCE? Well, let's look at some of the history of where BC and AD come from. For that, we need to look back to 500 CE and look at Dionysius Exigus. He is actually a monk who helped invent Anno Domini and BC. So in 500 CE, somewhere around the 6th century, he decided that he was going to uh, help set the calendar and help adjust some of the years. And he came up with AD, which is the same as CE. But AD doesn't mean after death, it means Anno Domini. And Anno Domini means the year of our Lord. So when people say 2012 AD, they mean 2012 Anno Domini or 2012, the year of our Lord. Let's look at what BC means. BCE is the same thing as BC. And BC does mean before Christ because uh, Dionysius Exegus did decide that he was going to try and start the years at what they thought the year that Jesus was born. And there is no year zero. There is one BCE and there is one CE, but there is no year zero. So BCE and B or BC, those are still the same. The numbers still do the same thing. They still get smaller so that 1000 BCE is before 500 BCE. 
and everything that was in BCE, meaning before Common Era, is before CE, which is the Common Era. So remember that BC and AD are slightly being changed because if you don't believe in Jesus being Christ, which many religions don't, or many non-religious people might not believe that, then it wouldn't make sense for you to say 2012 the year of our Lord or 5000 before Christ. So it's being changed to kind of a uh, more neutral term and people have been doing that to kind of try and be respectful for people who happen to not be Christian. So remember that BC before Christ is the same as BCE and AD Anno Domini year of our Lord is the same as CE common era. So what is periodization? Periodization is a technique that's used in the study of history. Each period is defined by three conditions. The first condition is geographical. A civilization may contract or shrink, get bigger or smaller, or spread from smaller to a wider area. The second condition is the increase or decrease in contacts. So we're going to look at contact with other civilizations across regions, either through trade, through conflict, or through migration. And finally, parallel developments are found across the globe, things that happen at the same time. Often these events do not happen at exactly the same time, so the dates are not the best way to define a period, but rather dates act as a guide and they often are, uh, are the source uh, of controversy over what dates to use. An example will be presented here and it's taken from the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, the thing that you are supposed to know. So we divide our time periods uh, for instance, into foundation time period, which is 800 to BC, uh, 500 BCE, the classical time period from 500 BCE to 600 AD, the post-classical time period from 600 AD to 1450 AD, the age of exploration from 1450 to 1750 AD, the age of revolution from 1750 to 1914 AD, and then starting in World War I, 1914 to the present. But there are many that are arguing that there's a new era post 9-11, that a postmodern era that we need to look at for history. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So turning points and eras are the two things that we are interested in using to, to classify how we divide our history. The two, idea, the two key ideas that we need to understand are then turning points in history and eras themselves. So the first of these is that eras are a large period of time. So as you begin, you're going to notice that early eras, also known as ages or periods, will usually stretch over very long periods of time. And as history moves closer to the present, the period of time is significantly shorter. What accounts for this difference in time is mainly that it's based on the developments that take place during that period of time. So a second factor is the amount of physical evidence that is especially recorded in that period or written evidence. Early time periods show that developments take a lot longer than they do now. We're in an internet age where developments can happen within milliseconds. So information is usually more generalized in the early periods and more specific in the modern era. Now, turning points are key, key changes. This is looking at change. A turning point is a common way of doing things that changes. The causes that can cause change may vary from region to region. They can vary, vary from era to era. But it's also 
uh, as we've said before, that these changes happen at different rates. For instance, when we look at the Neolithic Revolution, it takes thousands of years. When we look at the Internet era, we're only 16 years into it. A factor that affects the rate of change is contact with other societies like trade and war. The more contact, the more that civilization will adapt or risk the change of being absorbed by a more powerful society. And another catalyst for change would include disease, natural disaster, and advances or spread of technology. But this is not the only thing that causes a key turning point. So when we put eras and turning points together, putting the concept of the era and the turning point together allows historians to group large periods of time. The periods then begin with the rise of agriculture and, and civilization, are followed by a rise of regional empires, with this trend uh, continuing and leading to trans-regional empires or the age of exploration, increasing in contacts between um, what used to be separate societies. Key technological advances in the rate at which these contacts take place and the methods and the purposes for these contacts will eventually lead us to connections between the old and new world and take us beyond the idea of trans-regional to a global community of trade, globalization. Conquest and diffusion then becomes something of global impact. So finally, it ends with the 20th century when change is accelerated by things like communication technology, world wars, and global trade. And again, if you look at 9-11, September 11th of 2001, are we going to a new era of history? That is something that historians are debating now. So our first era of history is the foundation period. This begins at 8,000 BCE and it continues to 500 BC. As the name foundation implies, the civilizations that we study here are going to be the earliest civilizations and the earliest developments. What is significant in these developments that occur is that these, this era is going to be built on um, by periods that will follow. And this process will continue through time. So one era impacts another era, and the technological developments tend to accelerate. The key firsts in this era are the rise of agriculture and sedentary culture, because once we can start growing our own food, we can stay in one place. One thing that keeps in, to keep in mind with this period is that prior to those key firsts, all societies were nomadic, and that means they moved around. Some were still hunters and gatherers, but several had begun domesticating, growing animals for the use of food and fur, and they are better described as pastoralists. So these are people who raise animals. But the need for more food to, con to support larger sedentary populations, remember sedentary means staying in one place, resulted in improvements of farming. And these improvements further the population growth and civilizations begin to develop and blossom into city states. So we st start to see the development from small villages to city states, or then we come states with complex institutions. And this era or period is divided into two sub periods. One we call the Neolithic Revolution, and the other we call the River Valley Civilizations. And finally, the period ends with a large rise in regional empires like Persia and Greece. So we'll see how that, work, that develops. In the Classical period, 500 BCE to 600 AD, this is where major changes occur that start the era uh, in the development of large regional empires. These empires centralize power through the use of military aristocracies. And that means one ruler with a very large powerful military. And then also various forms of bureaucracy, which are people who are professional workers in a government. This allows these civilizations to integrate their regions through the use of roads, and sea travel. Permanent traditions will largely start in this foundation era, 
but become characteristic of the newly formed regional civilizations. The four main areas that we will study are China, India, Southwest Asia, which would include um, Vietnam and so forth, and then the Mediterranean Sea. These empires make strong contacts between regional centers. Other areas that grow in isolation from Europe and Asia are those in the Americas, Mesoamerica or Middle America, and the Andean culture in South America. But do not forget that th though civilization is growing rapidly, there are still a lot of societies that are outside the classical civilization form that made significant contributions to regional civilizations, like pastoralists and nomads. This period ends with the collapse of classical empires, such as Rome and Greece, when massive nomadic invasions coming from the Mongols sweep through Asia and Europe. In the post-classical age, it lasts from 600 AD to 1450 AD. The fall of the great classical empires will create an opportunity for civilizations and for pastoral societies outside of those civilizations to gain prominence. This is the beginning of the rise of Islam. It's also going to be become the first trans-regional civilizations as they span Eurasia, Europe and Asia, and Africa as well. The two great powers will merge in China and the Middle East. The spread of universalizing religions and philosophies such as Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, for just examples, promote ideas and equality and they will reunite the old regional empires and add new civilizations that become a network of global contacts. These new developments we'll see the rise of new civilization centers, and this period will come to an end with the conquest of the Mongols and the spread of the Black Death or Black Plague and new technological innovations in Asia. Then we get to the era of connecting East and West or the early modern era and it's also sometimes called the Age of Exploration. The early modern era or the connecting East and West era begins in 1450, which is right before Columbus discovers America, and it ends in 1750, which is right before the American Revolution. The rise of gunpowder empires in the Middle East and Europe will allow for the rise of Western Europe. So Western Europe starts to take prominence. Navigation techniques, which are borrowed from Asia, will allow the Iberian Peninsula. Do you know where the Iberian Peninsula is? That is Spain. Spain is the Iberian Peninsula. To rediscover the new world and thus the world begins to shrink. All the continents are included in a world network. Global trade starts to take place for the first time and this will lead to exchanges of goods and products. Flora, flowers and vegetables and fruits, fauna, which would be animals, people, germs and ideas. We call this the Columbian exchange. And these ideas and these things exchange between Europe um, uh, and the New World. Christianity is also part of this exchange, which is going to happen between East and West. And we get to the Age of Revolutions, which begin in 1750 and end in 1914 with the first of our world wars. And this era is characterized by very massive and rapid changes brought about by technology. You've had the Industrial Revolution by this point. These are changes caused by the Industrial Revolution, by political revolutions such as happening in the United States and France, brought on by the Enlightenment, a group of people who start to think about social problems. Intellectual changes will be caused by the Renaissance, 
and the Reformation. The Renaissance is the rebirth of learning and art, and the Reformation is changes in the church. Also, social changes will take place as people start to move around. People move from rural areas to urban areas, and a vast trade network will be solidified and dominated by Europe. So Europe then takes charge about this time, which leads us to Western global hegemony. That's a really complicated word. Hegemony simply means geographic control over an area that isn't connected to your country. So that means that the Europeans are going out and taking colonies. The nation state, the modern nation state will rise to replace previously formed systems of control with Great Britain and France and Germany, all competing to see how much of the world they can divvy up. And this is referred to as an age of imperialism. And others like Russia, the United States and Japan will start to compete and join with older European powers for um, a, a competition for control. Western culture will begin to dominate the globe through the idea of colonization. And the modern era begins in 1914 with World War I. And it continues to the present. And it's all about change, change, and change, and rapid change. These are its calling cards. We often refer to this as the American century or the retreat of Europe. The two world wars will severely alter the, the level or hierarchy of power and Europe's control over its colonies will shrink. And in addition, the areas of the Pacific Rim, India, and Southeast Asia will begin to rise in prominence. And this leads to the collapse of European colonial empires, which we call decolonization. And as modernization starts to bring industrial power to the areas outside of, of uh, the United States and Great Britain and France, local values and traditions will be challenged because we become a world based on making and buying things. As modernization promotes westernization, in other words, the growth of the dominance of the West, mass culture promoted by new telecommunication technologies, the ability to transmit television, radio, and internet, begin to transform the development of uh, languages, lingua francas is languages, and ways of the past are forgotten. And lastly, the battle between the new political forms will pit political and economic ideas of democracy and free enterprise against ideas such as socialism and communism, which we see happening today. And also totalitarianism, where you have one leader who's in complete control. These issues and other issues like genocide, ethnic cleansing, and terrorism promote the development of global organizations which attempt to protect human rights and to promote exchange. But at the same time, are we in a new era? September 11, 2001, did that really make such an impact that it has become a turning point? Many historians are starting to argue that we're living in a new era of world history with the rise of terrorism, both domestic and foreign, and the events of 9-11 signal a new turning point in world history. Uh, and I want to leave you with the thought, what do you think? Do you think that this is a new turning point in world history? I want you to consider evidence for and against this argument. Do a little research and as you consider your answer, and then I'm going to uh, post a place for you to uh, uh, write about this topic in your journal or actually submit it to me to be graded as a paper. And that's the end of this lesson.